Okay, good morning, folks. Good morning. Welcome to our topics class. We're continuing on in the series, What is Man? This is the third lesson in the series. If you didn't get the first two, they're laying behind me up here. And we're uh, probing the question, what is man? That's the question that the psalmist asks, asked in uh, the eighth psalm. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And the answer to, to the question is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Man is a spirit, he is a soul, and he is a body. So what we're doing is looking at the body of man. This will be the third Sunday on the body of man. And then next week, we're going for next two weeks, we're going to examine the soul of man. And then the following week, the spirit of man. Uh, we were going to spend one more week on the body of man, but I kind of changed it around a little bit. So um, what, what we'll be doing here, this will be the last Sunday on man's body, and next week we're going to begin to examine man's soul. Let's look to God in a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we come in the name of Jesus, the one and only name, the name that is above every name, Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus that he loved us and went to the cross and died for our sins. And Lord, he willingly went and willingly suffered all the pain and agony of, on Calvary that we deserve in hell. And Lord, he, we, we're just so thankful, Lord, he arose victorious over the grave and sin and death and lives at your right hand in heaven, that's your right, uh, sitting at your right hand, making intercession for us. So bless this time, Lord, as we study your word, might we realize we are really studying you because you're revealed in, to us in your word. So bless this time, we pray, and uh, bless our hearts and, and uh, strengthen us, edify us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the um, man, as we saw for the last two, two Sundays, is a physical body, okay? He's a physical body. And we saw last week that that body, the body of the believer, is a temple. It's called a temple on numerous occasions. And we're going to consider for a moment here that our bodies are also a tabernacle in addition to being a, to being a, a temple. Uh, unfortunately, Al is up there playing around when he should be on the, <laughs> on the PowerPoint. But twice the Apostle Paul has refers to his body as a, as a tabernacle in 2 Corinthians 5.1. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we're dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavenlies. Paul refers to this body here as a tabernacle. And then in that same chapter, he does it again in verse 4. He says, we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. You know, and the longer you're in this tabernacle, take it from someone who knows, the longer you're in this tabernacle, the more you groan, because there's more things to groan about. <laughs> you know, the older you get, it's, uh, you know, it's just... Um, uh, what do you got to look forward to outside of being with the Lord in heaven? But, you know, you, um, all of a sudden, uh, a lot of people that used to want to do business with you, like life insurance companies, they don't want to do business with you anymore. And uh, you make more and more trips to the doctor, more and more things go wrong and so forth. So that comes with aging. So we that are in this tabernacle, we groan, being burdened. And, and, and uh, he goes on and says, Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. He says we're going to get a brand new body. We won't be doing any groaning anymore in that, in that new body. Okay, Peter also twice refers to his body as a tabernacle. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 and he says, yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle, speaking of his body, to stir you up, putting you in remembrance. And then he goes on and he tells them he's going to die. Peter, when, when Peter wrote 2 Peter, uh, he was an old man by this time. And he says, I must, uh, the, he says, knowing shortly, I must put off this, my tabernacle. 
even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed him. Jesus told Peter how he was going to die. He says, you're going to die with your hands outstretched, and they're going to carry you in that position. And they did. They crucified Peter upside down on a cross. And so Jesus prophesied his death. Well, so here's four times in the New Testament where our body is referred to as a tabernacle. Now, in the Old Testament, both the tabernacle and the temple that were here on earth were only temporal. They were just here for a short time. It was around 1450 BC, approximately, when God instructed Moses and Aaron to build the tabernacle. And for the next um, uh, 500 years, God was worshiped in that tabernacle. And then Solomon comes along and he builds a temple. He replaces the tabernacle. So the tabernacle is replaced by Solomon's temple and it lasted about 300 years. And the Babylonians came in, destroyed the, destroyed the temple, knocked it down and, and so forth. Then after 70 years later, it was rebuilt and it lasted for about 400 years, about 500 years until the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. So both the tabernacle and the temple were just temporary houses for God. The Bible says there is a permanent house for God in heaven. But where does God live right now? He lives here in this temple, this tabernacle. This is, where, this is, God's, uh, this is God's home. We are temporarily housing deity. If you know Jesus as your personal savior, you are the house of God, the temple of God, your housing deity. Isn't that an awesome thought to think that the God of creation, the God that made this whole universe personally dwells within you? What an awesome thought. And you know, there are all of the, the false religions of the world, they have no such concept of this at all. Muhammad or Allah, they don't live in anybody. Buddha doesn't live in anybody. Confucius doesn't live in anybody. Shinto doesn't live in anybody. None of that. But we house deity. And that's why we're to care for our body, not defile it, because we're defiling the temple of God when we do so. Okay, so man, uh, our physical bodies are an engineering marvel. We saw last week. Some of the things concerning the body of man, just fantastic. Uh, the cells, trillions of cells, and inside those cells, all kinds of a, a different layers, really, of, uh, of uh, activity going on. And, and some of it, we don't even know what it, what's going on. And I mean, it's just, it's just mind boggling. And then the brain, we saw the human brain last week all the different circuits and billions of cells operating in the brain and doing, doing a million different things all at the same time. And, and then in addition to that, we saw, the, we saw the kidneys, how the kidneys filter out the bad things in our system and they keep the good things in our system. And then we saw how our blood, the blood circulates through the body and all the just dozen different functions that the blood is doing as, a, as it's, it's going through our body. It was just the body of man is an engineering marvel. It's beyond man's achievements. Now, inside, or I should say within our bodies, there are 11 different organ systems that are working. 11 different systems are working all the time, day and night. And they are functioning continuously to keep our bodies healthy and in working order. Now there's a chart in there, you don't need to look at it now, but there's a chart that, that gives you a brief little summary of what each, uh, each organ system is doing, okay? Now, amazing thing about our body is that, the, that these 11 different systems, they are absolutely necessary for our life to, to, to go on, for us to be alive. And the interesting thing about it is each one of them parallel, parallel the body of Christ, the church. And so there's some great spiritual truth here concerning these 11 functions of our body because they all have their parallel in the church, which is the body of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, our bodies then are physical types of Christ. Now in the book of Ephesians, 
the church is represented three different ways. We call it the three B's. The building of God, the body of Christ, and the bride of Christ. I should say the building of Christ, the body of Christ, and the bride of Christ. Now I want you to look at a verse here, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. It's talking about the church as a building. Look what it says. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built, because it's a building, you are built upon the foundation, buildings have foundations, of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And then look what it says about this building, which is the church. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Every part of the building is, is, it says, fitly framed together. It just fits together perfectly. Well, that's the church as a building. In Ephesians 4, we see the church uh, as a body. Follow with me, verse 15 and 16. It says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, there's the church now, the whole body fitly, there's the word fitly again, or fit, fitly joined together and compacted. Our bodies are compacted. We have over a thousand miles of tubes running through our bodies inside us. Can you imagine that? Let's think how long a mile is and then I multiply that by a thousand. Have a thousand miles of tubes and things running, running through our body, fitly compacted by that which every joint supplieth and recording, uh, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part. Every part working. Every part working. From your limbs to your brain, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, even down to little minute cells, which are trillions of cells within our body. And so the, the body is, a, is an engineering marvel, but it pictures the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now going to the next page, we have here, the, um, we start out with the first system, the digestive system. The digestive system convo converts food into energy. It does that by chewing, digesting and absorbing and then eliminating the waste from the food. And you have to eat to live. Isn't it a marvelous thing? You eat food and you swallow it, it goes down into your stomach, it begins to digest. And some, by some miraculous miracle that only God knows how it works, it takes the, all the good stuff out of that food, the stuff that we need, the protein and uh, the fat and the car uh, carbohydrates and all of those things, and it uh, spreads them around our body to, 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 to strengthen our body. And then what isn't any good, it goes on and that, that's eliminated. So the digestive system is a marvelous thing. Well. There's the counterpart to the church of Jesus Christ. In Luke 4, 4, Jesus answered and said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. Oh, we don't live by bread alone? No, he says, but by every word of God. Every word of God. That's every word from Genesis to Revelation. No one has the authority to take out even one word, let alone a verse or a passage or whatever because it, we, we are to live by every word of God. And he compares it to bread. This is the bread, the bread, the bread of life. And just as food is a must for our physical bodies, so is it for our spiritual bodies. We need to feed upon and digest the word of God. Not enough just to read it. Uh, when I first became a Christian, they told me I should start reading the New Testament. I sit down, I just read, you know, and it's kind of like reading a newspaper. Well, that's not how you read the Bible. You, you've got to feed on it and digest it to get something out of it. And that involves a little bit of work, a little bit of a study, and so forth. 
in Job chapter 23 and verse 12, Job says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job says, I need this more than I need my necessary food, food to keep me alive. In other words, Job says, I need my Bible before I need my breakfast. That's how important it was to Job. I've esteemed the words of my mouth more than my necessary food. Didn't say snack food, he says my necessary food. The food to keep my physical body alive. That's what we're to be feeding upon and digesting the word of God. And then in Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, thy words were found and I did eat them. He ate the word of God. He chewed it up, digested it, and was strengthened by it. And in Peter, 1 Peter 2, 2, Peter says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. How do we grow as Christians? By feeding on the word of God. Feeding, eating, digesting the word of God. That's where Christian growth comes, comes in. And you don't just... Uh, you know, come forward in a meeting and, and uh, jump around and do this and that and uh, call that Christian growth. That's not Christian growth at all. No, Christian growth is by feeding on the Word of God. And it's a process. It's not something that happens instantaneously. It's a process. Grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord, Second Peter 3.18 says. It's a growing process. So a lack of food results in weakness of the body, sickness, and death. We are concerned about different areas of the world where people don't have enough food and you see those pictures and they move your heart. People so just unbelievably thin and uh, you know that from lack of food. But there's a lot of Christians right here in this country that are in, are in that same condition spiritually. They haven't fed on the Word of God and don't feed on the Word of God. The secondly is the circulatory system. This involves the blood, the heart, and the blood and the blood vessels and so forth. And um, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Back there around 1450 years ago, uh, I'm sorry, 450 years BC, which would be 3400 years ago, um, God said that the life of our, the flesh, our bodies, life of our bodies is in the blood. Now it took the human race a long time to figure that out. To, to, to learn it on their own. For instance, George Washington died because he was bled to death by his doctors. They, George Washington got sick and, and the doctors came and back in those days they thought that the way you heal somebody was because their blood was bad, so you open up their veins and take blood out. <laughs> so poor George Washington, they opened up his veins and they took some blood and he didn't get any better. So they came back a second time and they took some more blood. He didn't get any better. And so they come the third time and they took blood and he died. Well, he, they bled him to death. Now there's a lot of doctors today, they're still bleeders, but they do it financially. <laughs> <laughs> but the life of the flesh is, is in the blood. Now in, in Hebrews 9.22, it says almost all things by the law are purged with blood and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. So the, spiritually, the body of Christ has the same need for blood that our physical bodies do. It needs the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Without the shedding of blood, which is the blood of Jesus Christ, there would be no church. There would be no body. Ephesians 1.7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Redemption through the blood. We're redeemed to God through the blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 9 tells us something else about the blood. It says, we are justified by his blood and will be saved from wrath through him. And so um, the blood is just as the blood is necessary in the physical body, so is it in the body of Christ. Now on the next page, I hope at the top of the page it says 1 John 1, 7. Does it? Yeah. Okay, that's good. There's, we had a, a last minute typo there. Okay. Uh, it's not, 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all unrighteousness. We're cleansed by the blood. Well, in our physical bodies, the heart pumps the blood into the arteries, and that blood is loaded with oxygen. 
and then the blood distributes it to all the parts of our bodies and then it returns to the heart by way of the veins. The artery, arteries take the blood um, away from the heart, distribute it amongst our bodies, the veins bring it back again where it picks up more oxygen and starts all over again. So this is a, this is a cycle that's going on. It's called a circulatory system. It run, it's a circuit. This blood is running this circuit uh, uh, all the time here. Now in that blood, there are also white corpuscles that fight off germs and bacteria and so forth. And so the blood is so necessary. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And just as, just as the circulatory system in our body is necessary, so in the body of Christ. Then the third system that we have operating in our body is the respiratory system. Our re respiration here, um, what happens? Our lungs suck in air and then marvelously, supernaturally, they separate the oxygen out of the air, as much oxygen as we need. And they, somehow that oxygen gets into the blood and, and then as we said, the blood circulates it all around the body. And then we exhale what's left, which is carbon dioxide. Because air is nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. We, 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 we breathe it in, and our bodies, our lungs, do something fabulous. They, they just remove the oxygen circulated around our body. The carbon dioxide, we, we exhale it. And plant with plants, it's just exactly the opposite. They, take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. So um, just this exactly the opposite. So um, the body of Christ also has a respiratory system. And that is called the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God. He is the breath of God. In Genesis 2-7, when the Bible says the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, look what it says he did. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's the Holy Spirit of God, the breath of life. And we read in Genesis 6, 17, God describes the human race that he's about to destroy in the flood as all, uh, each one wherein is the breath of life. And in the book of Ezekiel, where it's a prophecy of Israel being raised up at the last days, the, the, the body all comes together, the bodies, all these uh, soldiers, but it says there was no breath in them. And the passage closes by saying, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So the breath comes from God. Life comes from God. The breath is represented by the life, and, and it comes from God. John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So the breath represents the Holy Spirit. He is the breath of life. And it's amazing. We could, uh, you take a, a, a dead body and try to put life back in it. You can't do it because that life comes from God. Well, the, the, the church, the body of Christ gets the breath of life from the Holy Spirit of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God and that born again is being born of the Holy Spirit of God. So we have the parallel there. Then we come to the fourth system, the immune system. And our bodies fight off microbes and other intruders that would try to come in and cause us to be, get sick and die and so forth. Well, the body of Christ also has an immune system. It's called the armor of God. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And in verse 13 of Ephesians 6, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Well, the, um, uh, of all the armor of God, there is only one piece that is offensive. All the rest are defensive. The immune system that we have is defensive, basically defensive, but it does have one offensive weapon. And that is the, the white corpuscles in our blood that fight these microbes and germs and bacteria that would come into our body. So God, when he built the church, he compared it closely and, and um, 
uh, used the model of the human body. He created the human body and he created the church. And so he just uh, made a parallel there. Then we come, number five, to the excretory system. After extracting all the good out of food, the body must dispose of the waste products. Now there is something fantastic. How do we know what to, how does our bodies know what to dispose of? Did you ever hear the story about the thermos bottle? <laughs> Probably you haven't. There was, there was a radio station that sent a reporter out on the street. Every day they'd send a reporter out on the street and they'd ask a question and they'd ask a number of different people. Well, on this particular day, the question was, what is, was the most uh, amazing invention of the 20th century? And so the reporter goes out in the street and he asks the question, he gets a variety of answers from different people. Some said, well, I believe the microchip was the most amazing invention. Someone else says television was the most amazing invention. Another said the computer, and on and on and on it went. Finally, he comes to one man and he says, what is the most amazing invention of the 20th century? And he said, the thermos bottle. He says, the thermos bottle? He says, what's so amazing about a thermos bottle? He says, why man, don't you know? He says, you put hot stuff in it and it keeps it hot. He says, or you can put cold stuff in it and it keeps it cold. And so the reporter says, well, what's so amazing about that? And he says, how does it know the difference? How does, how does it know what to keep hot and what to keep cold? Well, consider our own bodies. How do our bodies know what to keep when we eat, know what to keep and what to dispose of. Who tells them that? Last week we saw, when we studied the kidneys, how the kidneys actually think. They filter out that which is bad and they keep that which is good. What an amazing creator we have, the God of all creation. Well, the body of Christ also has to dispose of, uh, of spiritual waste, because there is spiritual waste. Now in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, we're gonna see an example of it. In Philippians 3, Paul says, what things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. And he goes on and says, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and then he makes an interesting statement, and do count them but dung. I do count them but dung. Waste, manure, whatever. I looked that word dung up. It's, it's defined as excrement or manure, okay? Paul says everything in my life that was in my life before I met Jesus Christ, he says I count but dung or manure. And so what was in his life? Well, we back up here and to, in verses uh, three, uh, five and six, Philippians three, five and six, here's what was in Paul's life. Here were the, these were the things that were important to Paul before he got saved. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That would be Paul's credentials. If he was filling out an application for a job, he said, look here, I was zealous of Judaism. I, I did all these things above all of my, my brethren. He says, I, I did this and I did that. Look at my heritage here. I was a, a tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrew. I was a Pharisee and all of those things. The next verse he says, I count them but dung. Things in our life that have no, no uh, particular spiritual part, he says, just get rid of. And he writes that on numerous occasions. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 22, he says, put off or get rid of. Get rid of some things out of your life. Put off your former conversation or lifestyle, the old man which is corrupt, 
something that is corrupt. You don't want something corrupt in your body. Neither does Jesus. He doesn't want anything corrupt in his body. So get rid of it. Put it off. And then in Ephesians 4.25, he says, put away. There's something else to get rid of. Put away what? Lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. You know there are some Christians that lie. Lie like a rug. They can lie, lie, lie. You know, it's just unbelievable. What a shame. God says put away lying. Lying doesn't belong in the body of Christ. Get rid of it. Get it out of the body. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Wherefore come out. There's some things that have to come out of our bodies, come out of our lives, come out from among them, who are them, that's the world, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Jesus doesn't want unclean things in the body of Christ, his body. And then in 1 Corinthians, he says, flee fornication, flee fornication. Don't allow fornication in the body of Christ. And there's a lot of it going on right now. In this, in this present church age, there's a lot of it going on. And it's, for the most part, swept under the rug. Uh, that's a whole new, new topic we're not going to get into. But he says, flee fornication. And he gives a reason. For, that, uh, for he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. You sin against your own body, and, and what happens? It says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. You can't glorify God in your body if you're fornicating. You're living in sin, sexual sin, pornography, all kinds of stuff. Just get rid of it. It's defiling the body of Christ. It defiles your physical body, and it defiles the body of Christ as well. Okay, let's, let's continue on in our in our uh, probe of the 11 systems of the human body here. Bear with me a minute. All right. And when we come to the endocrine system, which is a system that is working all the time. It produces hormones and adrenaline, which we need. We need strength and energy. And sometimes, in such as cases of mental cases, or sometimes in great anger, or sometimes in emergency situations, and sometimes in cases of demon possession, that adrenaline so much is produced that the person has, for a short time, has superhuman strength. There have been all kinds of documented evidences of people under stress in a, in a great stressful situation that has been able to been able to exert almost superhuman strength and that's the the adrenaline uh, flowing in them now we have three in instances in the gospels where Jesus deals with a demon possessed man who has superhuman strength and in Luke 8:29 it says that he was kept bound with chains and in fetters and he broke the bands. And then in Matthew 8, 28, it said there was two men here possessed with devils. They, it says they were exceedingly fierce so that no man might pass their way. Everybody was afraid of them. And then in Mark chapter 5, it said about this, this particular man, he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him. The fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Our body is able to do that on, on, in certain stressful conditions. Well, the body of Christ also has great power and strength at its disposal, and all we have to do is tap into it. In Philippians 4.13, the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Jesus is the adrenaline in the body of Christ. He enables us to do all things. And in Hebrews 4.16, the scripture says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When a physical body is in a time of need, that's when that rush of adrenaline comes in. And the same is true in the body of Christ. Grace to help 
in time of need, when we really need that, that strength and that spiritual strength and that spiritual power, this is where God steps in. After all, Jesus, Jesus said in Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and be witnesses unto me and so forth. And many just ordinary people have done great things for God because of the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, let's go to the seventh system. The reason that is in our bodies, twice God tells the human race, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. The first one he said that to was Adam. The second one he said it to was to Noah. This is after the flood. Be fruitful, multiply, bring forth abundantly, and so forth. And how our bodies are able to reproduce, it is nothing short of a miracle. Number is 46. Every creature has a different chromosome number. Monkeys are 54, dogs are 22, cats are 36, horses are 58, and so forth. That's why you can't mate a cat and a dog together. They, they, they can't mate. Dogs have 22 chromosomes, cats have 36. Won't mate, okay? Now, the reproductive cells in our body only have 23 chromosomes. And when the sperm, uh, which is 23 chromosomes, and the egg unite, it makes 46. That's man's number, 46 here, okay? And reproduction occurs. Now, just as that occurs physically, and we have uh, upwards of 3 billion people in the world today, so there's been a lot of reproducing going on, each one of those is a fantastic miracle. It's just absolutely a miracle. I remember when my oldest son was born, uh, I was in the hospital there and there was, there was a guy there, his wife was having a baby at the same time and his, his uh, baby was born first. And, and he come out and he's weeping. He says, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. And I thought, you know, he's right. It, it is a miracle. I mean, it happens all the time, billions of times, but it's a miracle. Well, um, in the body of Christ, God wants us to reproduce. There's a reproductive system in the body of Christ. I want to show you four generations right here in one verse. Second Timothy 2.2. 2. Look what it says. Paul says, the things that thou hast heard of me. All right, number one is Paul. Here's, here's Paul, the first one. And he's speaking to Timothy. And he says, the things that you've heard of me. He won Timothy to the Lord. So here's two right here. He went, went uh, Timothy to the Lord. Here's two. He says, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men. Here's the third generation. Commit to faithful men. Men who will take it to heart. And then what are they going to do with it? Well, here's number four, who shall be able to teach others also. So you got four generations of Christians reproducing themselves from Paul to Timothy to faithful men to teaching others. And in, in uh, turn with me in your Bibles for just a minute. Uh, 2 Timothy. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul uh, referred to himself as Timothy's father, spiritual father. But there's more to it than that. He, Paul may have been the one that led Timothy to the Lord, but that's, that's not the whole story. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. Paul says, he's talking to Timothy here, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, okay, Timothy, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. Number one is Lois, his grandmother, and thy mother Eunice. Eunice is number two. And then thirdly, I am persuaded that is in thee also, Timothy's number three. So you got Lois, Eunice, Timothy in one family, passing on the word of God, reproducing themselves spiritually. This is what God wants his church to be doing, reproducing spiritually. And then number eight, 
We have the nervous system, which consists of the brain, the spinal cords, and the nerves. And this enables us to feel pain. And we don't like pain, but pain is a good thing. Uh, if you touch a hot stove or something that's, that's hot, uh, right away you feel pain, you let go. Otherwise, you'd burn yourself to, uh, you know, you just keep holding on to it and you have a, a, a terrible burn. Th things like that. But pain is an important thing. And the, the, the church, the body of Christ, feels a lot of pain. There's a lot of hurting Christians out there. I have no way of knowing statistically, but I know that during my lifetime, uh, maybe I'm just privy to more things now than I used to be, but I don't believe there was ever a generation of Christians in America that had all the hurts and the pains that this present generation does. And most of them are self-inflicted. Not all of them by any means, but most of them are self-inflicted. Then, number nine, we have the intergumentary system. That's probably not the way you pronounce it. But that's the skin and the hair and the nails. And our body's covered with skin. And you know what? That skin is constantly dying. It's dying all the time. In fact, they, people tell us that in a, in a house, if you're in a house and, and um, sun is coming in through the window and you see those little particles in the air, they tell us most of that is dead skin <laughs> from off of, our, off of our bodies, okay? And so our bodies is con are, are constantly reproducing uh, skin and um, replacing it. Now the same thing is going on in the body of Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.16, For which cause we faint not, but though, outward, throughout, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Just as our skin and the cells of our body, someone said that the cells of our body are changed every seven years or so. Uh, so you're not the same person you used to be. You're, uh, the, the cells of your body uh, have, all, have all been changed. It's kind of like, kind of like the story about the man with the 200 year old ax. The man sees this guy chopping wood and he, he says, it's a nice looking ax you've got there. And he says, well, he says, it's a good ax. He says, but it's over 200 years, to over 200 years old. It's been in our family that long. The guy says, really, you, you've kept an ax over 200 years? And he says, yep, same ax. And he says, well, we've had to replace the handle about 10 times. And then he says, there was about five or six times we had to replace the head. But it's the same ax. <laughs> this is the way it is in our bodies. They have the cells are, are being replaced all the time. And, and if what I read was correct, every seven years, you, you're, you're winding up with, the, with a brand new body. But it's still you. You know, when I was a kid, uh, when I was 13 years old, this is when I really, really got interested in baseball. The 1945 Detroit Tigers were in a pennant race and they ultimately won, went to the World Series and beat the Chicago Cubs. And I just hung on that. I mean, that was, to me, that was so good. That was when uh, the war was, uh, had just ended and many of the big stars were coming back from the war. I remember they got Hank Greenberg back and, and all of that. And I just, man, I just lived baseball, lived, acted, and breathed baseball. And I knew those 1945 Detroit Tigers. I could tell you, and you know what stuff you learned back then, you remember. You can't remember what I ate yesterday, but uh, stuff that you learned back then, you can remember. And I can tell you from memory, I can tell you their whole starting lineup. I can tell you their batting averages. I can tell you who their pitchers were and what their records were. Because I didn't put much, thing, much of value in my brain back in those days. But, um, but the, the, I did that, and that's, that's, still, that's still in my brain. I've never, never, never forgotten that. Well, we still have the Detroit Tigers. The far cry from what they were, but it's still the Detroit Tigers. You know what? There's not a single player from 1945 on that team. In fact, most of them are dead. But they've all been replaced down through the years in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and into the 2000s. 
keeps replacing, keeps replacing, keeps replacing. Players come, players go. They die, they get retired, they get traded, they get released, whatever. Still keeps going, but it's still the Detroit Tigers. Still the, still the same team, it's called the Tigers. Well, it's just a picture of what is going on in our bodies. Every cell being replaced, and renewed and so forth. And the same thing is happening in the body of Christ. The first century Christians comprised the body of Christ. The church today comprises the body of Christ. But there's 2,000 years in between when Christians have died, have been replaced, have been martyred, been killed, have died of natural causes, whatever, and have, and been, and have, been, have been replaced. We're, we're the cell replacements of the original church. It's been replaced and changed many, many times. So that's the system that is, that is working completely, uh, completely changing us, okay? And it's happening in the, in the body of Christ. All right, then we have number 10, the skeletal system which are the bones, the ligaments, the, car the cartilage. This is what supports the body. This is why we can stand up and move around because of the framework, these bones, the skeleton that is within us. The body of Christ needs a skeleton as well. Paul says in Galatians 5.1, stand fast in the liberty which you have in Christ Jesus and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In Ephesians 6, he says, having done all, stand. God wants us to stand. And this is what our bones allow our physical bodies to do. And in the body of Christ, he wants us to stand as well. Then the, here's the uh, 11th one, the muscular system. This is where our strength comes from. This is movement and, lo and locomotion all come from, uh, fr from our muscular system. Paul says to Timothy here in chapter 4, the end of verse 7 and the start of verse 8, he says, Exercise thyself rather unto godliness, for bodily exercise profiteth little. Bodily exercise profiteth little. You know, we spend, many of us spend so much time in bodily exercise, and he says, it bodily exercise profiteth little. He says, exercise yourself rather unto godliness, spiritual exercise. So the body of Christ needs exercise. Those muscles have to be exercised and so forth. And we do that by serving the Lord. Now, the human body is, it's a marvel. Here's another miracle in our human bodies that could not possibly have happened by evolution, and that is our eye. Did you know Charles Darwin, who started all that evolutionary nonsense, he, 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 uh, he cursed his own eyes because he, there's no way, he knew the eye could not have evolved. It, it's such a miraculous thing. Uh, number one, our eyes are movable. You can roll them around. They're not, you don't just have a fixed gaze. Uh, some of us have t tunnel vision, but uh, you don't need to because your eyes are movable. Uh, secondly, our eyes are protected by seven bones that dovetail together. They, they form a, a, like a socket, and our eyes are inset into that socket. That's for their protection. Just think if they were out there on the surface, you get, you get a whack, it, whack in the eye all the time. Uh, they're controlled by six different muscles. They're covered with a lid for protection. That lid wipes them clean daily. They close at night so we can sleep. They're equipped with a watering system, we call it tears, to clean them. They have a lubricating system to oil them. They are equipped with filters, we call them eyelashes. We have, and there's a, got a typo here, they have a diaphragm that opens and closes to let in just the right amount of light. If we're in a darkened room or in bright sunlight, that diaphragm will open or close accordingly to help us to see. There's a lens, we have a lens, our eyes are a lens, that change its shape so that you can focus on both close and, and distant objects at the same time. You know, with a camera lens, you can focus on something close, but anything in a distance is out of focus or vice versa. But our eyes, what a marvelous thing. It can focus on something close and it's in focus. And something back there is in focus. I can look at Sam here 
and uh, he's in focus. And I see Larry Mullins back there, he's still in focus. And so it's an amazing thing. Your camera won't do that. That's, that's what man comes up with, but the eyes can do that. And they are equipped with millions of electrical connections that handle one million messages all at the same time. That's why your eyes are always you know, like this. You're, you're aware of things going, going on around you. And um, uh, they contain 130 million rods, and that enables us to see in different shades of gray. Can you imagine that? Each eyeball has 130 million little rods in it. And they function so that you can see in different shades of gray. It's like watching an old black and white movie, the different shades of gray. And, but in addition to that, in, in addition to those 130 million rods, we also have seven million cones that enable us to see in color. So what a marvelous invention. And if you know anything about a lens on a camera, it inverts the subject it's, it's uh, focused on so that it's upside down. When you take a picture with a camera, it's actually taking that picture upside down. And our eyes, do, of course, being a lens, they, they switch it upside down, but then they're connected to part of our brain, and that part of the brain reverses that image so that we see things, we don't see things upside down, they're right side up. What a marvelous, what a marvelous thing. How, how did God do that? Well, he did it. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And so this is why Darwin cursed his eyes. Darwin said, the very thought of the complexity of the eye gives me chills. He couldn't explain it by evolution. And then he went on and he said on another occasion, to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd to the highest degree. And then he cursed his own eyes because he could not explain them through evolution. Well, God has given us eyes. He's given eyes to the body of Christ to see. Three things our spiritual eyes should be focusing on. Number one, to read and study and learn the word of God. The psalmist said in the 119th Psalm, open mine eyes, why? That I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The word of God. Open my eyes that I might see these wonderful things out of the word of God. And James said, Whosoever looketh, that's with the eyes, looketh into the perfect law of liberty. He's talking about the Bible here. The perfect law of liberty. We've got a perfect book. God has given us eyes to read, study, and learn this perfect book that we might know about him because it's his revelation to us. Then secondly, the second use of our spiritual eyes is in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's how we get saved. We use our spiritual eyes to look unto Jesus. In Isaiah 45, 22, he says, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. And then the third use of our eyes is to look for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. But the second coming, Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Every eye shall see him. So there's three uses for our spiritual eyes. And uh, along with the eyes, God made our ears. Here's, here's some more marvelous miracles that, that we take for granted every day. There's many who cannot see physically, they're blind and are deaf. And um, uh, there are many Christians who also are blind and deaf spiritually as well. And so the scripture says, how is your hearing? How is your hearing? Can you hear the voice of God? In Matthew 13, 13, Jesus said, I speak to them in parables because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not. Spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness is the worst kind of blindness and deaf, deafness that there is. And Matthew chapter 13, three, three more times, he talks about the fact that, that they see and don't see, and they hear and, and don't hear. And he concludes by saying, blessed are your eyes, for they see, 
and your ears, for they hear. So Paul, uh, Jesus said to the, to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he said to each one of them, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. We need to hear God's voice. Now, those are all the, the different systems that work in our body, all 11 of them. What holds all 11 systems together? What allows all these 11 systems to function? What keeps all these moving parts in order? And what holds our bodies together? Here is a picture of what holds it all together. You say, what is that? Well, it's called laminin. And it's a protein molecule so small that you cannot see it. It's invisible to the, to the uh, to the human eye. Too small to be seen without a microscope. And in your body there are trillions of these protein molecules. I wonder why God made them in the form of a cross. Isn't that something? What do they do? Well, the three short arms. One, two, three. Those three short arms bind together with other laminin molecules and they they actually form a sheet. And then the, the long arm, this one down here, this one binds to cells which anchor the organs of our membrane. They attach themselves to all the organs of our body, all the parts of our body, all the limbs of our body, and so forth. And they hold our body together. That's why when you walk down the street, you might be walking along, you don't have any of your fingers fall off or your nose drop down on the, on the ground. It holds all the body together holds it all together. And so it, 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 it's not per chance, I'm sure, that it's in the shape of a cross. Because Hebrews 1.3 says about Jesus, he upholds all things by the word of his power. The, and Hebrews 11, uh, notice this verse, it's right down in the bottom of your page. Hebrews 11.3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen, those things that we can see with our eyes, are not made. The things that we can see are not made of things which do appear. What does that mean? It means the things that we see are made of things that we can't see. And here's all the cells, the molecules, the atoms that are within our body. Here's the laminin that holds the whole thing together. He upholds all things by the word of his power. So the body of Christ is held together by the cross, just as our physical bodies are held together by this tiny mo molecules, which are in the shape of a cross. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the study of man's body. Next week, we are going to look at man's soul. For the next two weeks, we're going to look at man's soul. Now, beginning this Thursday, yes, and I'm sure God will bless you for it. Okay, uh, if you need any of the last two weeks lesson sheets, they're up here. If you didn't get a lesson sheet today, I should have asked you sooner. Uh, we have those up here also. Let's look to God in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Thank you now, Lord, for meeting us here. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for your precious word. In Jesus' name we pray now. Amen.